1 Timothy 3.15 You have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting Christ Jesus. I'm going to make nine points about the Bible. Point number one, Scripture is inspired. What do we mean by inspired? We don't just mean it's inspiring. We don't just mean it was really inspirational or that it was a stroke of genius. What we mean by inspired is that God breathed out Scripture through the apostles, that he affected, influenced, guided the thoughts and feelings and words of the writers of Scripture so that it was really and truly written by the human person, but it was also really and truly uh, the authorship of God. Verse 16 of 2 Timothy 3, all Scripture is inspired by God and useful. Number two, Scripture is useful. To say that Scripture is useful is to say that it is practical. To say that it is practical is to say that it is helpful. A lot of Christians believe that the Scripture is true, but they clearly don't seem to practically believe that it's useful, as evidenced by how much they neglect it. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. The psalmist is saying, your Bible is extremely helpful to keep me from stumbling over things that are in my path or from getting lost in life and making terrible mistakes and ruining things, bringing pain and hardship on me and others. The Bible is extremely practical and useful. Point number three, the Bible is a form of tradition. The reason you have a Bible is because the early church when false teaching crept into the early churches, gathered together and declared which books were of apostolic origin. And their living tradition, I was trained by this guy who was trained by this guy who was trained by Jesus himself. So their living tradition served as a litmus test to see which books found their way into the New Testament and which books were declared non-canonical. Without tradition, you don't even have a Bible. And the Bible is itself a form of the democracy of the dead, if you could put it that way. Your stupid opinion, limited by living only one little life in this world, is a small amount of wisdom. But what if you could compile the accumulated wisdom of 50 generations? You can, and it's in your Bible. Number four, what about the original manuscripts? Okay, every denomination has a statement about the Bible, and they say they go something like this. We believe that the Bible is the Word of God, inerrant and inspired and infallible in everything that it affirms, and then they have this little phrase at the end, in the original autographs. In other words, in the original letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians, that was perfect. There were no flaws. Here's the problem. We don't have the original letter. What we have is copies of copies of copies of copies of copies. All of the various manuscript copy families, because there's different copy families based on locations, are compared together to try to ascertain in a systematic fashion what the original said. And we're very, very sure about most of the verses in most of the New Testament. Let me give you an example of what I mean. In John chapter 8, the famous story where Jesus stoops to the ground when there's a woman caught in adultery who's brought to him and they want to, the Pharisees want to trap him because they expect him to be merciful. The Old Testament says if someone's caught in adultery, they should be stoned. And they believe that Jesus is going to err on the side of mercy rather than judgment. And so they bring this woman to Jesus caught in adultery and they throw her on the ground and they say, ha ha, the the Old Testament law says she should be stoned. What do you say? And you know the story. He writes on the ground something and we don't know what he wrote, but whatever he wrote, one by one, her accusers leave and then she's left alone with Jesus. And he says, is no one going to condemn you? Is there no one here to condemn you? And she said, no one, sir. And he says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. An incredible story that I believe is true. But you'll probably notice if you look in John chapter 8 in your translation, little brackets around that story. And if you look at the bottom of the page in your Bible, it says these verses are not original to John's gospel. Well, that's fast. How would they know that? Well, they would know that by comparing all the various manuscripts together and getting back to what they believe is the most convincing, oldest manuscript. Is that story original? The text critics say no, but is that story true? Well, now that's a different question. That's a different question. You're going to have to sort that out for yourself. Number five, the Bible can be translated. The Muslim faith 
states that the Quran is only inspired and inerrant and infallible and authoritative in the Arabic. Anytime you make a translation from one language to another language, you're also making a translation from one culture to another culture. For example, Isaiah, where God says, come reason with me, and though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Well, they were translating this for a group of people who lived near the equator and they'd never seen snow in their life. And so they had to find a different metaphor to communicate snow, white as snow, to these these people, and they chose something else. Is it still inspired? Well, shouldn't they just explain to those people what snow is? Well, they could. There's, those are translation choices. But every translation is an interpretation, and every interpretation risks losing something of the original sense. So is the Bible translatable? Well, Christians have always said that the Bible is translatable, and here's your first evidence. Even though the Bible, the Masoretic, was written in Hebrew, your New Testament apostles, whenever they quote the Old Testament, they almost exclusively quote a Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament called the Septuagint. The Septuagint, especially they quote the book of Isaiah. And if you look at the book of Isaiah in the Septuagint, in the, in the Greek translation of it, and you compare it to the Hebrew, the Greek is not only longer, but has a number of chapters that are not even in the Hebrew, but they put it in a totally different order. Now, if that doesn't mess with you, now you would say, well, then which one of the, which which version of Isaiah, the shorter version or the longer version, is inspired, the Hebrew or the Greek? Hebrew is God's language, says most Christ, say most Christians. What do you then do with the fact that the New Testament authors quote Isaiah more than any other book, and they quote it from the Septuagint, I think almost exclusively or exclusively? So, can it be translated? Well, if you look anything, if you treat the way the apostles treat the Bible seriously, then obviously the Bible can be translated. And if, you, yeah, if you're one of these people who's like really angry and picky about which translation is good, well, the apostles apparently were pretty flexible. Point six, what English translation is best? I remember when I was a baby Christian, I came into this idea. I bumped into these people who were King James Version only. And while the King James Version of the Bible, I think it was translated, what, in the year 1611 or something like that, is a great translation, especially for the time. Our translations are more accurate now than ever, is what I'm saying, because we have older and more manuscripts, original manuscripts, closer to the original manuscripts than we've ever had before. The last century has unearthed so much with archaeology. And the number two thing is the translation into the vernacular English of the time, that's no longer the vernacular of our time. So the text, so it's an amazing translation for what it was, but I would say... It's not really an ideal translation for today. If you're so freaked out about making sure you get the original Bible, then go read Hebrew and Greek. But if you want to give people a faithful New Testament in their language, the King James is not really a good one for that. I'll tell you what it is. It's beautiful. Psalm 23, come on. The King James is just beautiful. The Lord's Prayer, like if you try to get people to say the Lord's Prayer in non-King James, they'll look at you like, what's wrong with you? So what's the best English translation? I'm going to tell you there isn't a best. It depends on what you want to use the translation for. If you want the most clear word-for-word translation, then you pick a literal translation. The New American Standard Bible or the ESV, the English Standard Bible, these are really good for word for word translations, if you're going to be careful, study. Greek word order and English word order are so different that if you translate the Greek word for word, you come up with some really clunky, awkward English. A thought for thought translation is a paraphrase. This tries the best it can to bring the sense of the original in its culture into what that sense would be in our culture. Uh, it's not ideal for serious study, but it's very ideal for public reading of scripture, especially with people who maybe are not as versed in theological language. And then more of an extreme example of a thought for thought is Eugene Peterson's The Message, where it's very paraphrastic. I would never endorse reading The Message as your daily driver Bible, but I would often re refer people to keep a copy of The Message on hand to see, because it's almost a commentary at that point, to see kind of how did Eugene make a flourish of that? Anyone who wants serious study, I would push them more toward like the New American Standard or the English Standard Version or the New Revised Standard, something like that. I would push them away from the NIV because the NIV is like middle of the road. Sometimes it's word for word and sometimes it's thought for thought. And my attitude on that is make up your mind, pick one. Uh, that was number six. You know, what's the best translation? And what did I say? I like Bibles, okay? If you're reading them, it, it, <laughs> Awesome. I actually think it's helpful 
to switch what translation you use every couple of years just to keep it fresh and to keep yourself paying closer attention. Number seven, what about the imperfections in the Bible? What do you mean imperfections in the Bible? Well, what about the differences in the order of events in, for example, the last hours of Jesus' life? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They don't present these same events as happening in the same order. In a description of animals, it says that the hare chews the cud. Not that important, not a verse to change your life or anything like that, but like a cow has a bunch of stomachs, brings the food back up and rechews the... Rabbits don't. A hare does not chew the cud. Well, it makes that motion when it chews. Maybe someone thought it chewed the cud and it found its way into your Bible. That's not accurate. What do you do with that kind of stuff? Or uh, in Kings and Chronicles, if you add up all the dates of the kings when they are said to reign, the math does not match. The dates don't match. It doesn't work. And so different people have racked their brain coming up with different systems to try to make sense of that and harmonize that, right? And even, even just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in general, you find people working on a harmony of the Gospels, trying to take the differences of the way the events of Jesus's life are, the teachings and events, trying to make them all work together because if you look at them very carefully, it's like, oh, Mark tells the story in a different order than Luke and Luke tells it different than Matthew. Mm -hmm. Matthew based his off Mark, but Luke tells his different, and then John just takes a totally different approach. What are we going to do? So people spend all this time to harmonize these four Gospels, to make them agree, get behind the text to the history. I personally think that's a terrible disaster. My answer is this. The Bible is true and reliable when it is understood on its own terms. Let's go on the dates of the kings. Estimates were considered acceptable. And 40 means a generation. So I just think that when we apply some of these modern standards of measurement to a culture that says, it's about this, we end up getting frustrated. Another thing is genre is huge. Some people are like, I read my Bible literally. And I would say, no, read your Bible literately. So if your wife hands you a shopping list and you interpret it for, uh, it's a love letter, you're gonna find yourself bumping your head against the wall. Uh, Genesis 1, for example, is clearly a poem, not a science manual. You have God creating light before he creates sources of light. Well, that's interesting. I mean, so when you take the genre of each Bible writing correctly and interpret it on its own terms, it is reliable for what it is affirming. But if you try to read into it or out of it information that's not what it's about or how it's trying to function, then you're gonna, it's gonna have a hard time, you're gonna have a hard time dealing with it. I've noticed this. If you have a sympathetic approach to someone talking to you, you're not looking for the lies and to tear apart the details of what they've said, aha, aha. You're looking to say, why are they telling me this? You're looking for what their intent is. When people have a sympathetic approach to God and his book, instead of finding these contradictions and these details and getting all lost in the weeds and going, see, it's all a sham, and throwing the whole Bible away, they're going, of course the Bible's imperfect. It was written by people, copied down by people, and collected by people, and held together by people. But God was in the midst of these imperfect people. And what was God saying? What was God doing? When I was in seminary and college and I first discovered these kinds of things, it really freaked me out because I, th I had a certain way of thinking. I thought my beliefs were perfect and true and, and reliable. Now I know that Jesus is perfect and true and reliable and my beliefs about him are pretty changeable. But my beliefs about the Bible had to learn how to integrate the imperfections of the Bible. Uh, number eight, the Bible is the authoritative witness to Jesus. John chapter five, you search the scriptures because you think that they give you eternal life. Hmm, but the scriptures point to me yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Do you hear this? You think, you study the scriptures diligently thinking it's the Bible that brings you life, but the point of the Bible is to point to me to have life in me, and you're missing life because you're missing me. Uh, this is a big deal. This is a big deal. Luke uh, 24, post-resurrection, Jesus shows up to two disciples on the road to Emmaus, and he says, it says, then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from the scriptures all the things concerning himself. So all throughout the Old Testament, Jesus said, look, look, look at this, 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 this. Everything's pointing to me. Then he said, when I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand 
the scriptures. And then after that, what did they preach? What did they preach after he opened their minds to understand the scriptures? What did they preach from the scriptures? The only thing they preached was Jesus and all they used was scripture. It's possible for us to turn the Bible into a false God we are looking to save us instead of read the Bible as a witness to point our faith at the God of the Bible. So the Bible are the words of God, but Jesus is the capital W, word of God. Okay, number nine, the Bible is of supreme importance in the life of a believer. I'm going to quote, extended quote, John Wesley. I have thought, I am a creature of the day, passing through life as an arrow through the air. I am a spirit come from God and returning to God, just hovering over the great gulf till a few moments hence I am no more seen. I drop into an unchangeable eternity, and I want to know one thing, how to land safe on that happy shore. God himself has condescended to teach me the way. For this very reason he came from heaven. He has written it down in a book. Oh, give me that book. At any price, give me the book of God. I have it. Here is knowledge enough for me. Let me be a man of one book. Here then I am, far from the busy ways of men. I sit down alone. Only God is here. In his presence, I open, I read his book. Is there a doubt concerning the meaning of what I read? Does anything appear dark or intricate? I lift up my heart to the Father of lights. Lord, is it not your word? If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, and he gives liberally and upbraideth not. And you've said, if anyone is willing to do your will, he will know. And then I search after and I consider parallel passages of Scripture, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. I meditate thereon with all the attention and seriousness of which my mind is capable. And if any doubt still remains, I consult those who are experienced in the things of God, and then the writings whereby, being dead, yet they speak. And what I thus learn, that I teach. Number one, the Scripture is inspired. Number two, the Scripture is useful. Number three, the scripture is a result of good tradition. Number four, we don't have the original manuscripts, and that's okay. Number five, the Bible can be translated. Number six, what translation is best? It depends. Number seven, what do we do with the imperfections in the Bible? I embrace them and interpret the Bible on its own terms. Number eight, the Bible is the authoritative witness to Jesus. And number nine, the Bible is of supreme importance. Oh, give me this book. Why? That I might know him. In the covenant affirmation that we make at Gateway, uh, the statement that we make is, do you accept the Holy Scriptures as the very words of God? What is that? Inspiration. The final authority for belief and practice. Final authority. What do we mean? We say Jesus is Lord. You know, it's crazy, but there are people who call themselves Christians and say Jesus is Lord. They know Not only do they not read their Bibles, but when they read their Bibles, they disagree with their Bibles, thus giving the contradiction to the statement, Jesus is Lord. Ooh, Bible. Bible.